This short video shows how you would interconnect a heat pump with a condensing boiler. It shows how the heat pump can work in its own, the condensing boiler can work in its own, but also how the two of them can work together and yet maintain each other's efficiencies. We're going to see how to install the system, but also we're going to see how the manifold works internally. There are three ports on the left and on the right of the manifold that we're now using to connect the boilers. But you'll see that the heat pump uses the middle and bottom connection on the left, whereas the gas boiler uses the top and middle connection on the right. And we'll go through that in a while and you'll see why it makes sense. The installation is a sealed system using the gas boiler's internal pressure vessel to handle the expansion. But if we did want to add an additional pressure vessel, there are ports available, which we'll see in a while. We're using an Energy 4 manifold here, but you could use an Energy 5, which would have an extra two pipes underneath, or Energy 6. We also supply manifolds with additional zones underneath, up to any number, made specifically for whatever job is necessary. There are two zones underneath, each with their own pump with a return pipe on the right hand side. And the return pipe also has an isolation valve for the return, but that valve also includes a non-return valve. The return to the heat pump leaves the bottom left hand corner of the energy zone from the bottom chamber. You'll see the water first passes through a strainer that protects the heat exchanger inside the heat pump. Then it passes through a non-return valve. And lastly, on the left hand side, you'll see an immersion pipe stack. That's not absolutely necessary. It depends on the heat pump you're using, but it's there just as a precaution to make sure that something doesn't go wrong and you'd let hot water or overheated water go back to the heat pump because some of them go into a manual lockout, which have to be manually reset. Generally speaking, they're not needed, but you can check that out. We put a domestic hot water cylinder on the pair of connections underneath the manifold, with a pump on the left and the return coming in beside it on the right. If you follow the pipe down, you're going to see that from the pump, it goes through a non-return valve, which is the connection to the cylinder. The reason for this is once the cylinder is hot, you don't want heat drifting back out and up into the pipework and through the manifold, losing or dissipating the heat that you've just stored in the cylinder. We had a spare return port on the bottom right hand side, and we use that to connect an underfloor heating manifold return. We then take the flow for the underflow heating circuit from the top right hand corner. We've used a male iron elbow up there with a quarter inch manual vent. We'd use this when we're commissioning the underfloor circuit to vent the piper. You can see the two arrows at the top right hand corner. They are spare ports, but they could be used, for instance, for filling the system, or maybe you want to use one of them, the top one for adding chemicals into the system. So as such, it replaces the dosing pot, but it puts the water or the chemicals directly into the path of all of the water in the zones and all of the water heading back to the boiler. It couldn't have been a better location to put a dosing pot. We connected the radiator circuit underneath the manifold on the right hand zone, where again, you have a pump on the flow with the combined isolation valve, non-return valve on its right hand side. So if you stand back and have a look, you can see that it all fits together very neatly in a very logical kind of way that's simple to fault find and definitely very simple to install. Here we have the Energylex wiring center, our systems control module. It includes all the fusings, all the neutrals, all the earth connections, and it's capable of providing the power for the gas boiler and it controls, but it also controls the heat pump. It wouldn't provide the power for the heat pump, that has to come from a separate source because it would be too heavy. The Energylex therefore controls everything. It's just as easy to understand as the plumbing side. Everything again is set out in a very simple, clear, logical fashion. All of the terminals are identified. Uh, all of the LEDs show when the different parts are working. Just as the cream and the cake, it makes the system extremely simple to install and again, simple to fault find. We've now removed the front insulation and the front plate of the energy zone and inside you can see the baffles and the internal pipework. There's two long vertical pipes rising up into the top chamber. They would be used to draw the water down onto the respective pumps for the zones. The returns for those zones are to their right hand side and they arrive into the bottom chamber or return chamber. The middle chamber is a bypass chamber and there are many, many uses for that. One of them we're going to discuss just now. Also in the flow chamber at the top, you'll see pipe arriving at the right hand side 
brings any water that comes into that port right across to the left hand side of the flow chamber where it turns back on itself and all the water then will flow from left to right across the, t the flow chamber at the top. So if a boiler is connected to the top left hand connection, it would flow from left to right. But also, if a boiler is connected to the right hand connection, it'll pass through that pipe we just spoke about and then flows in the same direction from left to right across the flow chamber. The two bypasses at the right hand side of the energy zone are very unique in how they operate, in that the water can flow from the middle chamber up to the top or from the middle chamber down to the bottom. But also, the return water in the bottom in certain situations can rise up, which we'll see just in a while, into the middle chamber and out through the middle connection, or vice versa, the water coming through the middle chamber can rise up to the top chamber to supply zones. We'll see all that in a while, but this is the essence of how the energy zone works so efficiently. Here is the first of three scenes that show how the water behaves within the energy zone unit when it's operating. What's important to note is that the arrows that you see within the chambers kind of flowing arrows that range from dark brown to white do not indicate temperature, instead it indicates flow rate. So the darker the colour towards brown, the higher the intensity of the flow rate, and the white arrows indicate very little water activity. The heat pump on the left has a 10 kilowatt output and it's set to 50 degrees on the flow with a 5 degree drop across between flow to return. The flow rate is 0.478 kilograms per second, or just about half a litre per second. The flow from the heat pump connects into the middle connection on the left hand side and flows across the bypass chamber towards the bypasses on the right hand side. The hot water cylinder and the radiator zones are working and so their pumps are drawing water from the flow chamber and they pull the water coming in from the heat pump up through the bypass gap at the top into the different zones. So therefore the heat pump is supplying heat directly to the cylinder and radiator circuits. The cylinder has a 6 kilowatt heat load and requires 0 0.287 kilograms per second of water, whereas the radiators have just a 4 kilowatt heat load and require 0 0.191 kilograms per second flow rate. You can see the darker colour arrows on the cylinder circuit flowing down through the pump and the lighter colour going to the radiators has the lesser heat load and therefore the lesser requirement for flow rate. The water coming back from each of those zones is put through the return chamber and taken directly back into the heat pump for reheating. This second example is a great way to see the return bypass in operation, where the zone water is being collected in the return chamber, is passed along to the right, drawn up through the bypass on the return chamber, and is made available for the centre connection. And the centre connection is the return back to the gas boiler. So the coldest water is being supplied up through the return bypass and directly into the condensing boiler, maximising condensation. The gas boiler has a 20 kilowatt heat output and requires a flow rate of 0 0.478 kilograms per second with a 10 degree delta T drop from flow to return. The water leaving the gas boiler is then introduced to the top right hand connection in the energy zone manifold, flows through that internal pipe we spoke about, reverses and passes along from left to right across the top chamber, passing the two zones, the cylinder and the radiators that are calling on its way. The output from the gas boiler is at 60 degrees. It's being supplied to the cylinder, which has a 12 kilowatt load, and to the radiators, again at 60 degrees. But this time we've designed it for a 10 degree drop across both circuits, where the cylinder needs 0 0.287 kilograms per second, and the radiator circuit requires 0 0.191 kilograms per second. This third example is probably the most interesting one, because we have the gas boiler, being fed by the heat pump, both of them working at the same time. Even though the heat pump is delivering out at 50 degrees C with a 5 degree drop across its heat exchanger, and the gas boiler is delivering out at 60 degrees with a 10 degree drop across its exchanger. And yet the two of them are using the same flow rate of water, 0 0.478 kilograms per second. The appliance sizes were selected based on both of them working together where the gas boiler has 20 kilowatt output and the heat pump has a 10 kilowatt output coming to 30 kilowatts in total. 
But then the zones are the most important part because for them to work to bring the heat down to the 45 degree, we need to go back to the heat pump so it can be raised to the 50 degrees. And then for the gas boiler to take over and take it from 50 to 60, the zones have to be designed to drop the temperature with a delta T of 15 degrees. If you look at what's actually going on, the heat pump takes the 45 degree water, brings it up to 50. That's transferred across the middle of the bypass chamber and is introduced directly into the gas boiler return. In turn, the gas boiler takes it up to its exchanger, raises it to 60 degrees and delivers it back into the energy zone manifold at the top right hand corner, where again it travels through the internal pipe in the manifold and heads from left to right across the flow chamber. This time, the two heating circuits, the hot water cylinder and the radiators, are designed to have a 15 degree temperature drop across them. The domestic hot water coil has a requirement for 0.255 kilograms per second of a flow rate. That'll give us our 15 degree temperature drop. And the radiators have a flow rate requirement of 0.223 kilograms per second. So with the 15 degrees dropped from the 60 degree flow into the chamber, we now have return water coming back into the return bottom chamber in the manifold, which is 45 degrees. That 45 degrees then heads off on its journey once again back in through the heat pump, heated across the middle chamber into the gas boiler, heated to 60 and it heads off again. So even though it's mathematically complex to think about, the logic of the whole thing is so, so simple. This particular viewing angle gives us a very clear view of what's happening. You can see all of the water coming from the left in the middle chamber has been taken across. It doesn't drift up or down to the other chamber. It's taken entirely into the gas boiler and then the gas boiler simply carries that water on and heats it to its full design temperature. This example really highlights the difference between energy zone and any other form of manifold or, or pipe configuration that you might put together on the market, including low loss headers or close couple T's or whatever. The fact that you can put appliances together to do exactly what they're designed to do and make them work in harmony with each other as they deliver out to circuits that you preconceive would be the most efficient by doing your maths on flow rates and temperature drops and whatever. You really can make a superb job and it offers a very easy way in to do top class work. It's also important to note when you look at it that any reasonable plumber can make a very neat job by simply putting the manifold on the wall, connecting it up properly. The logic is already done. This also speeds up the whole installation process and therefore it has a direct effect on installation cost. So if you have a faster installation and the materials are dramatically reduced when you compare this to any other one, you can see that in fact it stands up on its own against all of the other methods like hybrid heat pump gas boiler, hybrid heat pump boil boilers, complex ways of putting the thing together. Hopefully you enjoy this. If you did, I'd like to think that you might like and share the video, or certainly you might comment and, and say what you find right or wrong about it. I'd very much appreciate it. From Energy Awareness, uh, we're trading under Seabox Energy. So if we can be of any help with any systems you're doing, or if you have any questions on this manifold or this type system, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you so much for taking the interest and hopefully you found it beneficial or interesting at the very least. So please like and share the video and let us know any comments that you'd have regarding more information or things that you'd have opinions on. Thank you.